that was one thing if Fred couldn't be here today and uh, he said that you had the opportunity to, you know, he's, he said, we're going to, we'll take Fred and we'll, we'll go feed him to the sharks. Yeah, we'll just <laughs> chum with Fred. Yeah. I <laughs> love asking the sharks. <laughs> This is episode 191 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny. Now let's run through a little bit of the news. The Fraser Museum. It's the first stop on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail located in the heart of downtown Louisville. But the news this week is that they are now selling Prohibition-era dusty bottles. In 2017, House Bill 100 passed that allowed retailers in bars in Kentucky to sell vintage whiskey, and it's good to see others now taking advantage of this new law. The Fraser does an incredible job of sharing the history of these distilleries, of where these bottles originated, because they were all lost during Prohibition. You can find out more at FraserMuseum.org. Barton 1792 is going to be in need of more repairs. On Tuesday, 60,000 gallons of mass spilled across the premises and covered the parking lots. Their beer wells experienced a failure. If you're unfamiliar, a beer well holds fermented mash before it is distilled. One tank failed, another tank was punctured, and a pipe on a third tank was damaged, causing the tanks to leak. According to news sources, two employees had been injured in the incident. Ryan and I will be presenting at the Louisville Bourbon Society on March 18th. Come, we want to see you there in person, learn more about the podcast, and get a chance to try some of our private label Pursuit Series. Your first attendance is free, and you can bring a friend. Get more information at thebourbonsociety.org. Trey Zoller made his first appearance on Bourbon Pursuit back on episode 63. We talked about the brand and how it began, his original voyage of Jefferson's Ocean, that long-lost rye, and the epic Stitzel Weller barrels. On this episode, he makes his return, but we're also joined by his father, Chet. We go back even further in time, before the brand was ever established, to talk about how he sourced whiskey, and if he's starting to feel the money squeeze, as today sourcing is becoming harder because distilleries want to start hanging on to their current stocks. Are you looking a way to support the show without joining Patreon? Spread the good word, give us an iTunes review, and share the podcast with a friend. Up next, we've got Joe from Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, Joe from Barrel Bourbon here. Every release is intentionally unique and can't be duplicated. Once it's gone, it's gone. Use our store locator to find a retailer or bar near you at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. As I walked into Doc Crow's, I was mesmerized, absolutely tickled with about to eat a big old rack of ribs. I was happy I had great company with me, and I was excited to talk to people I didn't know. I love talking to people about bourbon. I can't talk about it enough, even though that's how I make my living. It's also how I have fun. I love bourbon. What can I say? And at the bar were five people who were celebrating a friend's birthday. I walked up to them, started talking, and we kind of all hit it off. Some of them were in healthcare, some of them were in administrative work, and we just chatted. And it kind of reminded me of like what I love about Louisville is that no matter where you are, You can always talk to somebody, and you can find a couple people you may have in common. And I was in a moment. I was very happy, and I wanted to buy everyone a round of bourbon. So I looked at the shelf, and as I often do, my eyes spied something that I had liked in the past. It was a bottle of 2012 Old Forester birthday bourbon. Without looking at the menu, without asking the bartender for a price, I said, Four of those, please. And I made sure they were in Glencairn glasses, so I did specify the the glassware. As the whiskey hit my lips and I felt the complexities of it, I began to wonder, hmm, how much is this? And then we just started talking and having a good time, and I forgot all about it. And then the bartender comes up with a white piece of paper. He pushes it toward me. I flip it over. It was more than $500. After tip, the total bill was $600. And I couldn't believe it. After all these years of buying bourbon, I didn't even think to look at the menu. 
<laughs> I guess sometimes we all get caught up in the moment, and that was a wonderful time, and those were great people. But is it ever worth it to buy total strangers $600 worth of bourbon? you damn right it is. And you know what? I'll probably do it again one day. So hit me up and let me know when your birthday is, and maybe I'll just come out and buy you something nice. Most likely, Evan Williams bottled and bought, because the bank account's a little hurting right now after that $600 hit. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you've got an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. Search Fred Minnick. That's Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to an episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan on site here in Louisville at a founder's house. Yep. A co-founders <laughs> uh, we're sitting with today. But this is, uh, this is a guest that we'd had on the past. And it's, it's always fun to have Trey on from Jefferson's because he talks a lot about the business. Remember last time, one of the nuggets that I took away was when they were actually starting up the uh, Kentucky Artisan Craft Distillery. And he was talking about how it's actually so much more expensive it is to distill than it is to just buy your own and blend it and bottle it at that point. That was one of my takeaways. Yeah, I'm sure that, as we know, it's sourcing. Uh, the economy is a scale and everything. <laughs> People can make it a lot cheaper than, than you you can yourselves. But uh, I know I keep kicking myself in the head because I forget Trey lives so close to me. And, like, last time I think I said I was going to pop in, like, Kramer, you know, and <laughs> hang out and drink, but I never have. And, but now, watch out. I'm going to. <laughs> you, you know the address. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's in my database. You, yeah, you're exactly. one of my customers, so <laughs> it's funny. We I got here, and you know, we, Trey's like, well, "Come look at my back lawn," and I'm like, "All right, double dipping, get a podcast <laughs> and some lawn care out of it." Yeah, I know. We're making all money on all 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 fats. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. So with that, let's go ahead and introduce our guest. So today we have Trey and his father Chet Zoller. These men are the co-founders of Jefferson's Bourbon. So welcome to the show, fellas. Thanks well, a lot for having here. us. So. Trey, we've had you on before, so I kind of want to talk to Chet just a little bit first here and kind of kind of talk about growing up around bourbon or how did you really get into it? Because uh, I don't think I know all of your story. Well, grew up in the south end of Louisville, and uh, like most good Louisvians, I learned to drink my bourbon and a Coke at a football game <laughs> on Saturday. Um <laughs> But uh, uh, I did have an uncle who had a brand called Old Brownsboro. Um, and so I was familiar with the business uh, in that regard. Uh, but I practiced law, got out of law, and got into telecommunications. I sold my company and thought I had retired. And then Dre, and Trey came over one day, and he was in sales, didn't like particularly what he was doing and said, let's do something. So we explored some ideas, and uh, we're here in Kentucky, and what better thing could you do than get in the (laughs) bourbon business? Now, were you a bourbon fan, or were you just kind of like, yeah, well, sure, we'll go ahead and do it? Well, I've I've drank bourbon all my life, so sure, I was a fan. um, My favorite bourbon as a youth was uh, Old Fitz. And uh, turned out to be an excellent yeah. choice. <laughs> so um, I grew up uh, kind of in the shadow of uh, Churchill Downs and then very, very close to all the distilleries on 7th and 18th Street. So I could smell that heavenly smell when the wind was right from the distil- distilling that was going on. So uh, bourbon had always been part of my life, and it just seemed a natural thing to do. Um, in 1997, bourbon wasn't very popular. I don't know if you remember, mm-hmm. but um, they almost couldn't give bourbon away. Um, and so we discovered there was a lot of old bourbon available, excellent old bourbon. So Trey and I set about, went across the state, sampling bourbons and found one we liked and uh, decided to get in the business. Mm-hmm. So what made you think, like like you said, bourbon was unpopular and like, this is it, like this is gonna work, or how or did Trey have to convince you that this was gonna work? It's, it's like it's like getting into like the, the, the newspaper business today. Yeah. Right? Right. Thinking, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. I wanna start yeah. a magazine. Wait, yeah, <laughs> Let, let's start into dying business. Uh-huh. Uh, we had a couple different things that were going on at that point that were kind of parallel paths. 
one, single malt scotches were really starting to gain a lot of popularity, especially those with age statements. Um, I moved out of Louisville and to half a dozen different places around the country, and you couldn't find you know, Jim Beam, Wild Turkey, maybe Maker's Mark at the point, but that was about it as far as selection went. And then, um, as I said, single malts in D.C. and New Orleans, bigger cities that I were in, were very, very popular. And at about the same time, my dad and a few of his friends found the opportunity to buy a barrel of Bushmills. And um, we went over to Ireland mm -hmm. and uh, picked out our barrel. And they, uh, for the millennium, bottled it for us. It was a 25-year-old, 86-proof uh, product, which is a little higher than their average uh, product, and um, turned out to be an excellent whiskey. And that whetted the appetite to uh, get in the business. It was actually the first distillery I'd ever taken a tour of was in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Well, they probably didn't offer tours, yeah. you know, Man, much uh, very, they, back they really then. But yeah. so they, were, they were probably like, wait, you want to you see the inside yeah. of this place? <laughs> <laughs> right. Just a factory. <laughs> Uh, so I want to about the Bushmills, you know, being 25 years and being in Ireland, I guess with their colder climate, does the 25 year old Irish whiskey take on as much oak or tannins? You know, it's kind of like bourbons, they're like 25 year old whiskey here. It's kind of like, oh, sometimes it's not very good. Yeah. Well, th this was an excellent bourbon, but, you know, their temperature swings are so much less than ours yeah. that even though it's in the barrel that long, it really doesn't pick up the flavors that our, our whiskey does. And, of course, they're using used bourbon barrels. So I think the bourbon gets the first cut of that charred barrel mm -hmm. and most the flavors out of it. So even though it's been in that barrel that long, it's a, it's an excellent product, but mm -hmm. it's not bourbon. Right? Yeah, we got to we got to stop talking about Bushmills because we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna lose a lot of fans. Real quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dropping off. <laughs> yeah, they're like, and eh, we're done here. But I, I think the point at the time, I don't know that anyone else was selling single barrels, and this was a you know just kind of a time value of money proposition for them. You bought it in 1993 and it was going to be ready in 19 mm -hmm. in, in the year 2000. Yeah. So um, I, that really, as far as I know, that was the only thing offered anything like that. And I th think that opened our eyes into thinking, you know what, we could, you know, it, it would seem to reason that we could buy barrels from producers here in Kentucky. What did a barrel of 25 year old Bushmills run in 1993? Well, I guess it went 25 years in, but. Uh, it was $5,000. Okay. The same barrel sold in Europe was $9,000, a difference taxes. Okay. So we felt like it was a, a bargain. <laughs> so I found four other fellows who were willing, and we split a, a barrel. Uh, and I've still got some of those bottles available. <laughs> Very cool. Are they on the secondary? Uh, yeah. No, no. They're on the Facebook no. groups. <laughs> uh, part of my children and grandchildren's inheritance. <laughs> Hopefully it's worth something. Then, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so do you just, so you're wanting to go source barrels, you know, are you just approaching distilleries like, hey, what you got? Or, you know, what can we do? Or are they yeah. eager to see you because, like, we've got this stuff sitting around forever? I think we were the <laughs> only ones full enough, foolish enough to make the call. To uh -huh. Yeah, there was, they were more than happy to talk to us. They had plenty of whiskey. Um, you know, there were stories back then of people selling off 15, 20 year old barrels of bourbon basically to get it off their books and for the price of the wood only. And back then, a used barrel would be about forty dollars. I mean, it very, very inexpensive barrels at the time. Wow, very different. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's yeah. very, very true. different from today's world. So I want to rewind a little bit because Chet, you're also sort of a, a bourbon historian to a degree as well. I mean, tell me very well. Like you had a book, you've got a lot of stuff with old labels, and you were kind of a maybe like a, a prohibition, pre-prohibition kind of know it all too. Kind of talk about your your history and lore of of bourbon too. Well, I've always had a fascination with history. And uh, Trey and I worked together three or four years and turned the business over to him. And then I decided to learn all I could about bourbon, but there hadn't been many books written on the subject. So I started researching, and after about six or seven years, uh, my friends encouraged me to go ahead and put it together in a book, which I did. 
And I'm now working on my fourth printing of that same book, which is Bourbon in Kentucky. And then I've done a second book called Kentucky Bourbon Barons, which are about the movers and shakers in the bourbon business in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And um, I go around the state and the country giving talks on uh, the history of bourbon. Um, and, uh, of course, I get to taste a lot of Trey's bourbon as we do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, so that's a, there's a plus side to it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a large upside to it. So, you know, going back to forming the business together as kind of a father and son, you know, Chet, I'll kind of look at you first because it sounded like he was, he was like, all right, we need money to kind of get this thing going, right? Did you, did you look at it like, well, all right, well, I'll help my boy out. We'll kind of see what, what's going on here now. Did you really think it's going to, was going to be as successful as it is today? Oh, we had no idea. We had no exit plan. Uh, We just thought it was something that would be fun to do together. And it was. We had a great time. Trey did most of the sales, the traveling. I did the stuff inside, the back room kind of things. So we didn't get any Did you have the mule? (laughs) You had had the mule trying to figure (laughs) out what the cherry barrels were? So it it was a great partnership. And uh, uh, as it turned out, it worked out. Famously, mm-hmm. well, I think our original is about to say. I was like, "Come on, there had to be there had to be one a few roadblocks in here. We got to talk about there those. were a lot of roadblocks." We, you know, first of all, our, our first projections. I think we were way ambitious. <laughs> um, <laughs> it took years to get there, and then you know, from what's happened in the last, you know, really ten years, no one could have projected, and, and you know, just there was. Most of what we do today, if we tried to do that you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it would have fallen on deaf ears. So there's a bourbon consumer here that just wasn't around um, 20 years ago. We went to the first bourbon festival and you know, I, I talk about Julian Van Winkle and myself. We had the same deal, buy five cases, get one case, no charge. And between the two of us, we didn't sell a dozen deals. I mean, just, there wasn't anyone out there looking for high-end bourbon. So things have really changed. But, yeah, there were a lot of obstacles. And there's some obstacles that are present today that weren't there um, back then. One is the lack of supply that's obvious. But when I started, there were nine distributors here in Kentucky. Typically in most states, there's really two distributors now. So, And of those distributors, most of those guys aren't looking for one SKU brand. It's just not worth their time for the most part. So when there was nine out in the marketplace, then you could get in with a distributor. If you could go out there and work the market for them, they could take ownership of it eventually and start pushing your product. It's a different proposition now. So you had mentioned that, you know, it was really hard. You and you and JVW were sitting there trying to sell your products and basically give some away as just an incentive to be able to do it. You said people weren't purchasing high-end premium spirits at the time, or maybe just high-end premium bourbon. Now, did you kind of see that as like, oh, shit, maybe maybe we're pricing it too high, or should we have or should we have tried to go for that that that, that, oh, that old that, crow, that, that old well, tailor kind of yeah, like... I knew that you know, a bargain proposition, you know, we would get crushed by the big guys, so that was never an option for us. Um, and then I saw you know, the proposition, our product versus, say, single malts. I thought we had a better product, and I still think we have a better product. And I think it's more expensive to make a, a great bourbon than it would be a great scotch. Just the time value of money, the new barrel, you know, the evaporation rate, it's expensive to do it. And I, you know, looked at my dad to the history of it and saw that things came in cycles. And, you know, two times in our country's history, bourbon sold more than all other spirits combined. So if we had enough uh, longevity, then somehow it would catch back up. But certainly didn't think it would catch up the way it, it has today. And you guys have mentioned scotch a few times. Chad, I'll, I'll run this one over to you. What's the next big hurdle, do you think, for bourbon to kind of leapfrog scotch or even come close to the sales of what it's seeing because we've already seen that bourbon and rum are kind of increasing in sales in regards of worldwide um uh, consumption and stuff like that however it's still not near the the number of where scotch is well uh, the folks that made bourbon 
um, in its very, very lean years in the 70s and 80s, they kind of shot themselves in the foot to help sales. They cheapened the price and cheapened the image of the product. So it took quite a while to overcome that, to make people realize that it really is a premium product. And as Trey suggests, probably without doubt, the most expensive distilled spirit there is. So um, people now recognize uh, bourbon for what it is, a superior product. And I think that's gaining momentum all over the world. And I have little doubt that uh, within the next 10, 20 years, they'll sell more bourbon than they will scotch. What do you think? Oh, go ahead. I'm going over to Vietnam in a couple of weeks, and I'm doing something at the embassy, and they're bringing me over there in order to help push the, uh, the viability of bourbon to Southeast Asia and I'm going to be visiting and there's actually a number of Are people. you going to be on a boat doing it as well? Or? <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> never know. But um, I, I think it's a perception problem that as my dad was saying it's taken a lot of years to get there and we haven't had the push overseas that we had domestically. And Diageo has really uh, bulldozed the way in China and a lot of other Asian countries. Uh, they, they bought up a lot of bars and restaurants and nightclubs that they own, and so they are pushing what they have, which is mainly scotch. So Johnny Walker has been the lead dog out there. Um, but I think there's opportunity as and, you know, bourbon being a corn-based product is an easier product because most people have grown up drinking cor- you know, corn star- starch uh, soft drinks, Coke, things like that. It's an easier transition. Just because of the sweetness or the nature of the of it. Yeah. And I think that it's just a matter of getting, you know, right now in those countries, if it doesn't say scotch, it's not going to sell. It's a perception that people just need to get over. So, you know, will it take time? Yes. But can it happen? Absolutely. I guess with that, though, the, the like everyday drinkers, the people that I guess, you know, what bourbon was built for, you know, the everyday, they're kind of like, well, we're getting kind of squeezed out of this because at the, everybody's focused on premium. You see Heaven Hill cutting like the six year, you know, white label. Right. So like yep. we're there, we're kind of like, well, we're getting priced out of, you know, where we want to be too. Well, as it's, I think there's still, especially what's going on with production lately. You know, we're in a tight spot right now, as you guys were talking about mm-hmm. earlier sourcing product, you know, there, there's certainly a, sor- a shortage today. Um, if you look at the production and how much the the category is growing, there is going to be a point where there's going to be a glut again. And you know, who knows exactly where that access point comes. But I think you're still, there's always going to be that premium and allocated items that are going to be, you know, tried to, they're going to be tried to be stretched across what's going to be a worldwide market. Mm-hmm. At some point, but there, there's going to be value products for, you know, for the long term. And so I kind of want your take on that as well, because or at least within the kind of the previous conversation about our brands, do you think underselling themselves on the value of their product? Um, because, you know, it's it's there's there's different price points that people want to hit, you know, and you're trying to come to a, a premium category. And uh, we talked about the old crows and the old tailors you kind of see down mm-hmm. down here and the you know some of the ones in the plastic jugs. Now, do you think a lot of those are underselling themselves? Do you still think that's that's just the nature of the market and those still have to exist? I think uh, a lot of that's you know they're underselling themselves. Um, I think they can go up a little bit, but there's always going to be that market down there um, because there are big producers out there that are going to guarantee that those markets are out there and you know. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, everything is an evolution. And, you know, as I said, very few people start drinking bourbon neat right off the bat. You know, as my dad said, he started like most of us here, which is different than a lot of people now. I think everybody in this room, probably their first bourbon was a bourbon and Coke or bourbon and seven. I was in. I'm a bourbon and ginger man. (laughs) Bourbon and ginger. There you go. (laughs) I was in Brooklyn recently and ordered a Jefferson's Ocean on the rocks and they wouldn't serve it to me. No, <laughs> no, you can't have it with the rocks. You've got to drink that neat. 
And I'm like, okay, can I have a neat glass of ocean <laughs> with, the ice on with top. an ice? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're like, I make this stuff. I can do it with the whole world. Oh, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure he probably didn't want to go in like that, right? He probably no, didn't say yeah. anything. But, you know, so there's there are a lot of people now that are coming to Bourbon from from the get-go thinking you Straight out the gate, yeah. Which is, you know... That's kind of a tough pill to swallow. It's kind of like doing a double flip off the high dive first time in the pool. So you know, most people don't come in drinking neat bourbon, nor do they come into the high end of the the range right away. It, mm-hmm. It's a graduation, and it should be a graduation. You know, you, you shouldn't be paying up for certain products until your palate has gotten to a certain point. Right. But so, do you think go like, ahead. today's con- I guess the new guys in bourbon, you see them, we see them online, but they all went to the, just the expensive bottle. They never really like go for the medium price or the, they're just like so focused on limited releases. And why, isn't that a mistake though? There's all they want's twin oak. That's yeah, all they're looking I, I for is twin oak. Right now there's any of the big producers in Kentucky are making a great product and yeah, they're aging it long enough. They know they've got distilling down to a T. They're making great products. So, you know, there's value out there. Now, if there's different nuances and there's certain characteristics that you either want to get rid of or you want to enhance, then there's certainly you know, plenty of options out there now that weren't out there when we started. Mm-hmm. So I kind of want to bring it back a little bit to the uh, to your whiskey as well. And Chet, I'll kind of spin this over to you. Because when you guys were coming out with this particular brand, you know, we had talked about, you had just mentioned, you know, whether they're coming at a high proof, they're coming at low proof, they're figuring out what they're going to mix it with. What was the flavor profile or the type of consumer that you were targeting when you're coming out with your, your initial launch? Well, because we were so small, we had to find a niche that made sense for us. And that was the high end market. <laughs> that market was small back then, but so were we. So um, you could buy a really nice bottle of whiskey back then, a fifth of whiskey for $25. We introduced a 15-year-old product at $50 uh, a fifth, which was outlandish, Mm -hmm. but it worked. You know, there's always that segment of the market that is willing to step up and pay a little more for a quality product. So we worked very hard on the name, on the bottle, the package, uh, to make it uh, what it is. You, if you don't pick the bottle off the shelf, you can't find out what's inside. So we knew what they'd like the whiskey. Um, it was a very rich, full-bodied whiskey. Uh, we just needed to get people to pick the bottle up. So How we, did you convince them to do that, to make that leap with you? <laughs> well, we, got, <laughs> we didn't have a marketing budget, that's for sure. <laughs> we got exceedingly... Besides doing the market. buy four cases, give one. Give one <laughs> that, that, was our, <laughs> yeah, that was our deal at Whiskey Fest. <laughs> yeah. Whiskey Fest only. We uh, tried to come up with a name that was associated with uh, uh, high-quality Jefferson's We wanted to help create a renaissance in the bourbon business. What better man than Jefferson's, a renaissance man? We uh, used... That was our first slogan, wasn't it? It was. (laughs) What was the slogan? Uh, The the, the renaissance bourbon. (laughs) It was perhaps... The bourbon renaissance for a man or woman, something. I've forgotten. (laughs) But we... We actually went out and found a perfume bottle and used it for the style and shape of our bottle and just blew it up <clears throat> into fist size because we discovered a lot of women were buying the high-end products. Mm-hmm. So we got lucky again. It worked. What research went into that to figure out that you, you found out women were fun? Oh, we, we had lots of research <laughs> sitting over the kitchen table drinking bourbon and saying, yeah, I think this. I think they're going to like we this. We saw <laughs> something that said that more, more women are purchasing the product. Maybe the men dictated what to purchase, but they were actually the one buying it. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming, were you only selling in Kentucky at a certain time? or was Well, this- we started off with the only... Yeah, we started off with what was Commonwealth uh, Distributors that is actually it was the Vertner Smith uh, 
distributorship at the time, which has been bought out and bought out and bought out and now is Republic National. Um, and then I think my first sales trip, I went to the WSWA in San Francisco, couldn't afford even a booth on the floor, or not to mention a suite. So I literally, my mom loves this story. I rode the elevator and escalators up and down with a briefcase and looking at name tags and anybody that I saw was a distributor. I had my bottle in their face. So how difficult is it to make Straight that hustle right yeah, there? Yeah, that's right. To get in, for, you know, you start in Kentucky, but to get to other states, talk about the challenges to... Hey, it was really difficult. Um, I, you know, again, there was no market for high-end bourbon. So my second market, luckily I met somebody at that WSWA, the Wine and Spirits Wholesalers Association, distributor in Nashville. And he said, all right, we sell some bourbon down here and um, we'll give you a shot. So basically I would go down there Monday through Thursday uh, for the first couple of months that we got into that market and just you know selling bottles one at a time. And he picked up the phone, called somebody in Georgia and say, hey, I've got somebody down here. He'll go out there and hustle for you. He's got a great product. Take a look at it. And I, actually, when we got that distributor, that was National Distributing Company. And at the time, they probably had seven or eight states. And I thought, and he said, okay, I'm going to take you into all of them. I thought we hit gold. I thought we were done. Are you like, yes, but oh shit, we got to come up with a bunch of juice now? <laughs> no, no, the juice wasn't a problem. So that wasn't the issue. It was, yes, all right. But you know, you have to understand these guys were bringing it in. And you can grow you know, from a physical standpoint, geography-wise, too quickly, too fast. I mm -hmm. couldn't support you. Know, it was just me going out there. So I couldn't support those other states and... Yeah, you know, I couldn't spend Monday through Thursday in each market, each you know. So, it uh, that that wasn't the promised <laughs> land that we thought it would be. So it was just it was a slow grind. Yeah, I also kind of want to rewind to when you guys were starting to start blending your mm -hmm. first barrels together. Who was who kind of took the lead, and who who figured like this is this is going to be the winner like how can we replicate this over and over kind of kind of talk about that process well we started um we bought a couple lines we the first one we found jefferson's reserve we fell in love with right away we kind of both looked at each other and said that's it that's the one that we've been looking for now were you all the ones blending it or do you have some outside help that were that we was were just buying at this point and so it wasn't a blend it was one recipe one age that was it. Mm -hmm. We decided what proof to cut it, and that was that was all we did with it. Um, if you want to spill more, I'm sure listeners would love to hear you know who you're sourcing it from, the recipe, the mash bill. <laughs> you know, um, unfortunately, I'd be proud to, to beat my chest and tell you who it was because they're great producers. Chet's legal side will come out and say, uh, <laughs> uh, "It's our suppliers that have." Um, it historically said in our contract, we can't disclose who it is. So we, we haven't done that. Um, but we came, we found another one that we really liked. And as we named the first one after Thomas Jefferson, because we thought it was complex and sophisticated like Thomas Jefferson, we found one that was spicy and big and bold and named that Sam Houston. Came out with another one, Old Iron Skillet. We came out with Jefferson's. Old Iron Skillet. Uh -huh. Just go, just tell me, lead me through the thought process of this one. Is this another, you were sitting around the kitchen and you're like, well, an Old shit. Iron Skillet? My, my dad, um, there was a, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a restaurant by the name of Old Iron Skillet. And they wanted a uh, proprietary, proprietary. proprietary <laughs> brand. So, how long have you been drinking today? You've <laughs> been so, counting those LaCroix. <laughs> um, we bottled up a, a batch, and uh, it sold very, very well. Yeah. I'm delighted to say. Was that a revitalization of, of a label they had, or was it just they just said, like, we just, we just no, want to name? Of yours, we just want a name. A friend of his from college owned the restaurant, right? Right. Bowling yeah. Green. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, yeah. um, but, uh, so I started, you know, as we started collecting these different recipes and barrels we you know started well, i can't come out with a different label each time we find something we like and we started playing around with them and found that the whole was better than the parts and 
So we, we made the decision, let's go ahead and start blending. And we thought it's terrifying. We, we may lose all of our customers, all six of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, At that time, were you, were you blending form or were they just like single barrels? And you're like, I'll just give you 150 bottles or whatever, whatever the hell's no, in the barrel. We, it was about eight to 12 barrels. Okay. At the time. So, you know, just dump it and hope for the best. Is that no, we would, you know, scientifically break it down. <laughs> <laughs> eh, you know, in some way, we had to measure it out here, pretty well. There. Yeah. yeah, and that's exactly what we did. And so, you know, that became fun because we were creating our own. And uh, it's you know, our, our first real. Um, step into in, doing something a little bit different or something a little bit unique for us. I want and some, at the time, nobody was blending, or if they were, they certainly weren't talking about it. Bourbon Pursuit wouldn't be possible without the support of our Patreon community and with help of our following partners. Now, I've never been inside a prison before, but that's exactly what the folks at Rack House Whiskey Club did when they recently took a trip to North Carolina. Behind cell blocks east and west, they found barrels of bourbon being aged, and it's entirely legal. Rackhouse Whiskey Club stumbled upon Whiskey Prison. It's the home to Southern Grace Distilleries at Mount Pleasant Prison. The prison opened in 1929 during the height of Prohibition, and as many as 140 prisoners called it home until it closed in 2011. In 2016, a new operation moved in, and this secure facility houses more than 14,000 gallons of aging whiskey. Conviction Small Batch Bourbon is the first bourbon ever to be legally aged behind bars. It's the prison you'd probably want to break into. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse ships out two of the featured distillery's finest bottles, along with some cool merchandise, in a box to your door every two months. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try a bottle of conviction today. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. I want some tips on blending because Kenny and I, we're trying to... We're, 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 we're getting there. We're it's getting not, there, but every time we try to do a blend, like single barrels is easy, you know, mm-hmm. to go pick those. I think that, yeah, you know... You like it? If you like it, it's great. Let's bottle it. But doing that blend and making it taste good, I don't know. Okay. Help me. Trial and error. Help me. <laughs> Trial and error. You know, you get a few ideas of what profile you're looking for and think, okay, what would help me get to that profile? And then, you know, it's just trial and error. And then once you hone it down, it gets easier and easier because you have a good idea what your base is going to be. Mm-hmm. Like you know, for our Jefferson's Reserve, we've got four different recipes in there. One of it, our base comprises about 65%. The other three can kind of float. But, you know, what percentages and what age and have a good idea what will get you there. Okay. So, like, when you're blending, say you have, like, you know, there's a range, I'm sure, of years and barrels. And you said it was 65%. So, like, like, I guess we were talking about this the other day. When you go and you tap into a six-year barrel and you're like, it's just not there. But will it be there in, like, three to four years or will it just continue to you know, you're about to say suck, didn't suck. you? <laughs> Luckily, you can or, blend off the ones that Or can do. you tell at that six year that it's going to progress to nine to ten that the uh, way we you think know, it will, and we're yeah, going to leave you, it alone? You start getting at that point where yeah. you can figure out how it's going to go. But, you know, that's it takes years because you got to just wait and anticipate and kind of mark it down what you think is going to happen to it in the future and check and see if it does. Okay. Cool. I want to also talk to you about all the, I guess, relationships and uh, you, you talked about suppliers and whatnot. There's a lot that, because there's a stigma around sourced whiskey that, oh, they're just buying barrels, dumping it. Like, talk about all the moving parts, I guess, of sourcing because you have packaging and bottlers and all this and all that to make it, you know, happen, if you can talk about uh, it. Yeah, I mean, it's bottling and uh, you know, packaging and all that. That's just sourcing you know, your dry goods. That, that's... That's the easy part once you figured it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then sourcing, it's, you know, we've had 20 year relationships. So, um, you know, it, it, it is, we talked about, we'll lay down 8,000 barrels of new fill this year. 
We'll do about 2,300 out at our distillery, Kentucky Artisan Distillery. The rest is from big distillers here in Kentucky that have been making our recipe. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, if I had to go to them today and negotiate that, my price wouldn't be <laughs> where it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, we've got a great distillery and we do it actually we just won award for the best craft distillery today um and i'm really proud with what's going on out there you know we're growing our grains at the farm that butts up to the the distillery we've got some historic stills we've got the only malting house um we've got some really fun and cool things but you know i I just saw chuck algary say something with, with all the changes of the distillers going on right now and somebody asked the question, what's going to change with the whiskey now that these distillers have changed? And his answer was, most of these guys would tell you, hopefully not a damn thing. <laughs> right. Because their job is to make it consistent and sell. Mm-hmm. And Plus the team that's underneath of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. absolutely. And all the yeah. systems and processes yeah, right. in place. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's the goal of, the, of a distiller is to make the same product over and over and over. So... When we source from a big distillery like that, we'll get that consistency. They can make that more consistent than we can at ours because it's just one economies of scale and they're running the same thing over and over and over. So, you know, if you look at, so I just came from Scotland and went to about eight different distilleries there. Everybody, the whiskey maker in Scotland is a guy who blends the barrels together. The distiller is the production manager. So, to me, if I can get great source product, it's definitely just as satisfying to me as what we're making ourselves because it's what we take that source product and do with it afterwards. That's what's interesting to me, and that's where I think we can do something a little bit different. Uh, I told somebody not too long ago, you know, what would I try to do by getting into distilling myself? I'm not. I'm never going to out Jimmy Russell. Jimmy Russell, <laughs> right? You know that's. You know, there's generations of knowledge in there, and you know, technique, and it, as you, what? How many distilleries have you identified in Kentucky alone? About twenty four hundred. <laughs> when we started, there were eight left in Kentucky. That's right. And as I said earlier, they all make incredible juice. Mm-hmm. It's what happens to it. And this is what made me interested in getting into the maturation of it. Every distiller would say the same thing. 70, somewhere 75% of what bourbon is comes from the maturation process. It's once it hits the wood that really starts to turn from whiskey into bourbon, that's when you can manipulate it one way or the other. So I think they're with source whiskey too. There's, I don't know, there's kind of like a contradiction because these distilleries that are sourcing the product are saying, well, we make our own stuff, you know, we're pounding our chest, but they're, they're happy to sell it though to, you know, people that want to source whiskey. So it's like, are they the ones causing this, you know, bad drama or bad stigma with source whiskey or where, well, where do you think that comes from? Well, I think most of them have sourced whiskey themselves from somebody else at some point in time. Mm-hmm. If not yesterday, no, nobody's guilty or nobody's, nobody's innocent in this whole game. <laughs> right. 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 And you know, I, that's a selling point for them. You know, they can control it, you know, vertically from, from point A all the way to Z. So yeah, they, I think there is a selling point in that and there's something to be said for that. Um, and I don't think, you know, you look in wines and other spirits, people source for other people all the time. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Like Tylenol, my emergency thing. I poured an <laughs> emergency pack the other day and that was the generic brand. And it actually said package for same company that does emergency. And I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's in every industry, you oh, know. But sure. for some reason in bourbon, though, it's like people go kind of crazy about it. And, it, you know, it's... Because like you said, distilling is an exact you know you're it's making a, a consistent product but when you're blending and making your own that's where the magic is you know and picking your own barrels and that's all Trey Trey yeah. is the blender I never had any part of that 
I will say I did have a part in going around with him to the various sources <laughs> and finding our whiskey. And you learn pretty quick which sources worked for our brand. Mm -hmm. So uh, it didn't take long. You know, you have all these choices available, but it didn't take long to figure out what worked mm -hmm. well together. So another question from the business side, are you ending up in sort of like maybe a turf war nowadays where if you're if you're sourcing from a particular distillery and all of a sudden somebody comes in and they're they're waving their checkbook around and you're like, well, hey, guys, we've been been doing business for yeah, over 15, 20 years, 15, yeah, like 20 so. years. And uh, those are those are my barrels. And it's not us. We don't have a checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> Our then, checkbook is very small. That, yeah. that, yeah. They're, they're trying to squeeze you for a few more dollars out of these barrels. Now, do you do you end up with those turf wars at any point? Uh, yeah. well, I see. I see Chet's eye. He's like, oh, <laughs> fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it, we, we've been lucky that we've been able to source the way we have been for so long. But, you know, we now, we just completed our third warehouse. That's going to hold 13,000 barrels. We've already laid the foundation for a fourth. So we're laying down a lot of whiskey right now. That's fantastic. So, you know, it's, it's something we've got. We just bought an additional 14 acres to our property. And we are contemplating whether to build out to where we would be able to um, produce 100% of what we needed. And that comes, you know, it, there's a lot of things to weigh there. One, you've got the initial yeah, the capital cost. Pros, cons. Pros, cons. Yeah, cost, benefit, benefit analysis. You got it. <laughs> but it, it goes further than just cost benefits. Um, you know, it's nice to have different suppliers, um, you know, in case something happens. And as we talked about it earlier, it's more expensive for us to make our bourbon ourselves than it is to source from someone else currently. Now, as we've expanded and we've just ordered six more fermenters out there, so we'll be able to expand more, we've been able to bring our cost way down. But it's still, there's, you know, it's mm -hmm. economies of scale. Absolutely. So, you know, it's something that, you know, it's something that we're taking a really strong look at, but um, it's not the end all be all for me right now. So I, I kind of want to move move past this conversation a little bit and kind of talk about your pet sharks. Yeah, <laughs> and, and 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 Chad, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss this one over to you. You know, when when Trey came with you and he says like, I got this idea, and this what kind of spurred off for Jefferson's Ocean. Which anybody that wants to know more about it, please go listen to the past episode. He kind of talked about Juan Share and all this other kind of fun mm -hmm. stuff on there. What did you think of it? Were you just like, Jesus Christ, Trey, come on, this is, this is a gimmick? Or were you like, this is a fantastic idea? What did you think? I thought it was an excellent idea, and it turned out it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, that barrel does so many things that people just don't keep in mind. It's not only breathing out, it's breathing in. So that salt air came right through that barrel. And when he brought that... Um, that first bottle home, I, I just, <laughs> it was the best thing I ever tasted. It was almost black in color and just heavenly. <laughs> it was wonderful. So, and he's always coming up with ideas like that. So, um, as he What's your favorite of his ideas? Oh, man. <laughs> Put you on the spot. There's been so many. Um, you know, I like the, the product that's finished in the Roth. Cabernet mm -hmm. uh, cast. Uh, um, his Twin Oaks product is excellent. Uh, of course, uh, we all remember the 17 and 18 year old stuff that he had for a while. Unfortunately, didn't have enough of it. <laughs> but uh, story of everybody's life, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he has just come out with some terrific products. Well, let's talk about the Twin Oak because we just you poured that for you us it. and. Uh, this, yeah. <laughs> this is actually our double barrel. So I've got a, the Twin Oak as well. Oh, the okay. difference between those two, um, the Twin Oak was a 16-year-old that we double barreled for 
I should say Twin Oak did because we <laughs> Twin Oak did for five years. So we put it into a new barrel when it was 11 years old and kept it in there, which I would have never have guessed we would have kept it in there for that long. But it, I thought it kept in, improving along the way. And did you just forget about it? You're like, oh, shit, I got this thing that's been <laughs> no. around for five years. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot this other no, project. No, that's <laughs> the best thing about it. You get to go back and taste all these experiments. Been too focused on oceans. I forgot about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but I, I think it tastes, it came out great. And I'll pour some of this for you in just a second. Um, but it, one of the things, because it was a heavier char on there, I think it cleaned it up as well. So uh, it, uh, it imparted a lot of flavor, but it doesn't taste tanniny like you would think it would. Mm -hmm. Now, were you taking Jefferson's Reserve? That was 11 years old and then putting in here, or are these just Correct. extra barrels? Okay. That's exactly what it was. And was it already blended as Jefferson Reserve? Did any put in the barrels, or was it kind of like, well, we'll just take uh, barrels was, and keep dumping and we'll figure this out? It, well, I should say it was the base bourbon for Jefferson's Reserve. So it w would have been what we originally sourced those that same recipe in barrels. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then on the double oak, which we did a proprietary barrel. We took 10 year old bourbon and I've been working with independent stave company. I was down at, I became a barrel chef for them in 2012 on their hundredth year anniversary. And while I was down at their cooperage in, in Missouri, not the one in Kentucky and became a barrel chef. I saw all the different techniques that they were putting into wine barrels and different spirit barrels from around the world. I think they've got somewhere close to a dozen, dozen cooperages around the world. And when I thought about all the techniques that they've developed over the years and all the expertise that had gone into those techniques, I thought, well, why are we only doing it this one rudimentary way as we are here in Kentucky? Number four, alligator char everywhere. You got it. You got it. So why not try to incorporate some of the, the things that they've developed and other spirits and wines and bring it into the bourbon world? So I took some whiskey that was some bourbon that was uh, distilled in aged in Kentucky and, um, and aged in a number three char barrel. And I put it into a barrel that it, we did probably five, six dozen different experiments to honed in. Got one that had been seasoned and flash charred and toasted to bring out a mocha flavor and then grooved out so you have twice as much surface area on it. And... Uh, excuse me, double barreled it for an additional four months. And that's what you were just drinking. It brings out a lot of flavor there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine's gone. It was very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it goes fast, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so an another question for you as while you are looking at bringing in, uh, you know, your, your own distillate into this and plus your, your age source product, at some point, are you going to try to follow along the path that Smooth Ambler's done with, say, Contradiction and start blending some of your, um, you know, some of your distillate with the source stuff? Or do you think that there's opportunity for brand and line extension at that point? Uh, a little bit of both. So what we're distilling over at uh, Kentucky Artisan Distillery is higher, it's a higher concentration of rye, so 36 rye. It's also put in the barrel at 110 proof. And we use toasted barrels. And so it's it's going to be what I call our blending um, bourbon that's coming of age. So a little bit of that goes a long way. But I think there's certainly going to be a market for it to come out with its own product. Um, some of the rye, we are... Um, as a matter of fact, well, we've uh -oh. got some, uh -oh. we go. some rye right here that is... Awesome. We won't say been no to finished that. in a couple different things that uh, got a guest bedroom here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, we'll start. We need to bring out the dartboard. And be like, all right, what do we think this is aged in? So that's 115 proof that you're tasting right there. Yummy. It's interesting you at the finish because you've had the Jefferson's ride. Uh, at one point in history, and then that sort of uh, was it just depleted stocks at that point. You just couldn't keep up with it. This, correct. Mm -hmm. And so now you're you're starting to bring it back out to the market, but in a kind of a a tray fashion, if you will. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we've come out, I think, with 18 different products. Beside 16 of those 18, we do more than what most people do, which is distill 
age cut to proof in bottle. Mm -hmm. So our 10 year old rye, I t didn't do a thing with that. And some of our presidential, I just bottle and cut to proof. Mm -hmm. um, All right. It's time to guess what, what do you think this was barreled in? I, Cause it, you kind of think it might be, might be an old rum barrel, but I'm, I'm thinking that he doesn't want to do the same thing that angels envy did. I don't know. Um, what do you think, Ryan? That or uh, it's not a rum barrel. How? Let's see. Here's another. We'll, we'll figure this out. How <laughs> how big is the barrel? How many gallons? <laughs> uh, well, we'll leave that one alone for a little bit. So that's something that uh, we're working on right now. That it, it, it's whatever fun it is, to, I like it. No, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. It's really cool. Yeah, excellent product. Mm -hmm. and, and those two are a little bit different. Um, Oh, we're not drinking the same thing? No, but they're close. Well, here, pass it mm. over. You're thinking I didn't drink it? Yeah, that. I was like, <laughs> I was like, mine doesn't taste like rum. <laughs> but I was like, maybe I'm off today. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? All right, I'm going to pour you one last one. This is the 16-year-old Twinwood. Because. And now the, this one, I remember last time we had I talked. see where you think the rum in this. Maybe. Mm -hmm. maybe. Last time we had talked on the podcast, we had actually talked and we said, is there ever going to be another Jefferson's presidential release? And you said, I think so. Wait for it. Wait for <laughs> it. Right. And I think this might've been the one that finally came out that, that we were talking about. Could have been. Mm -hmm. Probably. It was so long ago. Yeah, I know. Remember, yeah. like, we got to do this more often. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll remember when you were Wednesdays here with Trey. <laughs> <laughs> and Chet. Well, I'm delighted to say as we've gone around to our sources, uh, almost a hundred percent i can say that we agree on the whiskey we choose mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of amazing um i don't know if that's a father-son kind of thing but uh we've been very fortunate in not having any difficult you inherited the same palate yes you know. i guess <laughs> yeah. i've been stealing his whiskey for so yeah, long exactly. <laughs> yeah you were drinking old fits <laughs> growing up you know? exactly <laughs> strolls and old fits <laughs> that was a combination but yeah and that has been a, a lot of the fun it's been so much fun to be able to do this together and uh you know, have that common bond and just to do this today together um you know, it's a lot of most father sons don't get the opportunity to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely it is a family affair and i think that's kind of what we wanted to capture today was you know really looking at what you all did together to help build the brand in the early days and some yeah. of the struggles that you went through and everything like that now we are reaching up to the top of the hour here but i so i want to talk about this the 16 year twin oak so kind of give us uh, a little bit of background because i know this is this is already come and gone Man, no, at least, at least most the of the area fantastic. right i just i wanted to get your old take on it i did hear one of your podcasts where you brought it up and you didn't have a chance to taste it, so I wanted to, wanted you all to taste it and see what you thought. Well, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. I mean, this is great. Day. Now we got to make sure we watch what we say because he's, oh, no. he's no, everybody's, he's, everybody's he's, listening. He's everybody's not. listening. <laughs> <laughs> he travels a lot, so you know he's got time to, <laughs> to listen to us. It's great. It's yeah. a lot of depth of flavors in there. Um, I mean. I think also being 16 year, you definitely wow. get That's some really of good. those those deep dark uh, oak and kind of pieces that that really come into it. The leather, the caramels, a lot of the leather comes out. And as I said, this surprised me. I had no intentions of leaving that in there, double oak for or twin wood, as we call it, yeah, for five years. And it it's clean. It's still very flavorful, but cleaner than I would have guessed. Now, do you have uh, potentially more of these that'll make its way to the market? Like you got more sitting in these uh, one of these three rick houses. You've got we've, holding we've got some here. interesting <laughs> things. <here. laughs> yeah, we've got some nice things coming out. So I'm excited about our pipeline. Mm -hmm. So when's the next trip uh, down the uh, the Nola? Because I know that was an experiment that you had oh, tried. Yeah, that as was well. when we were we were just yeah. talking about that. That was just taking off. I think. You bet. Um, so we're about to release those. I think we're going to go ahead and uh, start selling the journey at the uh, gift shop in Crestwood um, 1st of November. So uh, it came out great. You know, that's a very small volume. We actually had two more barrels that did the great loop, um, which we just got back and 
Yeah, I'll show it to you. It's right in there. You can't imagine the color on a year old product that looks as dark as a 15 year old product. Really? So it's indicative. But does it taste like a 15 year old product? It tastes extremely easy and smooth. You still get a little grassiness or a little grain up Mm -hmm. front. So, but there's no question as we bottled the journey and we kind of co-pack it together with another, with a barrel that was distilled on the same day and aged in Kentucky. In my mind, night and day, totally night and day. And it explains why bourbon really proliferated in Kentucky because people who were tasting this product, the distillers had no idea how good it could have been because this is what changed whiskey to bourbon for the first time, that journey that it took. And by the time it got to the East Coast, it transformed into a a completely different product. It was so much far superior than the one that aged in Kentucky. That's why people paid so much more for the bourbon coming from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And And they still do now. I think he sounds like he has to buy a bigger boat to, to go down to New Orleans got more it. often. I think that's probably yeah. what it is. <laughs> so that journey actually, it started off, the first leg of the journey went to New Orleans. Then we got it down to Key West eventually, up to Fort Lauderdale, lost our boat during Hurricane Matthew, had a hitchhike up to New York, and it took four boats. We had two hurricanes, a tropical storm. We had oh, to wow. send new barrels down to Key West and huh. siphon the juice out of the old barrels into the new barrels because they, the barrel heads had warped and popped. Um, That's one hell of a story. I was was about to say, I was like, whiskey's like, let me tell you what I've been through. (laughs) And uh, actually, Popular Mechanics did a great story breaking it down molecularly and showing the difference between the the, what happened on the the bourbon that went on the journey versus the one that stayed here in Kentucky. Very cool. So when it actually went on the journey, you had to bring it back. You're like, all right, fuck it, we're putting it on the truck and sending it back. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna do this. Well, by that time, yes. However, the same guy that we hitchhiked with took the barrel. It took two more barrels around for us, and again, it came out wonderful. So you, you, tell me about the hitchhike. Like you weren't like, were you literally had your fingers out like you're on the river? Yeah, like, like, or did you make well, a phone call? Kind of talk about we're going. This. Well, <laughs> we made a few phone calls. And I found that there's a group called the Great Loopers that take a loop going up the East Coast, up the Hudson River into the Great Lakes and down into Kentucky through the Tom Bigby Waterway, back into Mobile Bay and down to Florida and back around. And there's a group of people that do this throughout the year. And there was someone that was curious enough when we put out the SOS, can you help us out, to say... (laughs) This sounds like fun. Be there in three days. <laughs> <laughs> so we were a little worried. They're probably like, there's at least a few bottles in it for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> I tried to give them as much finished goods as possible so we wouldn't touch the stuff in barrel. Yeah. Smart move. <laughs> Smart move. <laughs> so I think that'll that'll be good to, to kind of wrap this up. You know, this was, this was fun. I think we could probably talk about this for another oh, hour yeah. if we really wanted to because, you know, really – as I said earlier, capturing the story of you two starting the brand, understanding what it went in to actually build it. I think it's fascinating. It, it is always fun. And it's always awesome to be able to come here and try some of these innovations that you're doing. There's a lot of people, it doesn't matter who we talk to, but there's a common theme that come up and they always like, we're, we're innovating. Uh, we just released our first sherry cask and we're like, all right, fuck it. Like that's been done. <laughs> right. That's been done. But you're truly thinking like way outside of of this particular box that most people are. Yeah. You know, it's fun. Once you peel back a layer of the onion, you see, okay, if that worked, why couldn't this work? And you can keep pushing in that direction. And that's, that's, what's fun for me to see, you know, we've got a number of experiments going. Some of them don't turn out. Some of them do. And, you know, you get to keep tasting them. So I have, a, I have a canoe trip that I do every year yeah. in the Ozarks. If you uh, want to hook me yeah, up, I'll, you got it. it. Called the Jack's Fork Special. <laughs> I don't know if the TTB would let us on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you fit a fifty-three gallon barrel in that canoe? Uh, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be floating real, real low, <laughs> riding low, and that. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, Trey and Chet, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure to have you all. If you want to know more about Jefferson's. Make sure you go follow all of their social media online. Uh, they've got a great website too. I remember you could, used to be able to go and you could track the the, the journey that some of these things were mm-hmm. going on as well. Is that is that still going on? 
Well, we're not, we don't have that journey going on right now. You can track the ocean voyages and we just caught Oh yeah, talk about, the, talk about your, shark. we totally forgot about talk your pet sharks. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Talk so about the pet shark real After quick. two years, O-Search, um, which is the friend of mine, Chris Fisher, who's our mayor's brother from here in Louisville, who's the expedition leader of O-Search, who's trying to save the world's ocean from the top predator down, for the last two years has been trying to catch a mature male great white shark. Um, he's caught, he just caught seven of them in Nova Scotia and named one of them Jefferson's. So it's a 12 pound, seven inch great white that will be tracked as it, uh, every time the, the fin comes up, it pings, sends information back. And what happens, there are scientists from around the world. He basically lays out the information, gives it to any university, marina, aquarium, to hopefully try to find the answers to the world's ocean and make sure our grandkids have fish sandwiches. <laughs> Got a lot of Catholics around here. So you know, as he on would Fridays. Say, <laughs> drink bourbon and do good for the ocean. That's all right. So how'd you, by the way, how'd you get hooked up with that and going through the, the research part of it? So Chris is a childhood friend of mine. He invited me down on a ship in Costa Rica for our 40th birthday. And while we were on the ship, we drank a lot of bourbon and I saw it sloshing around in a bottle. And I thought this would happen in a barrel. It's going to change the maturation process. Hey, Chris, let's put some barrels on your ship. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, my crew catches great white sharks. Probably not a good idea. But the we'll more put, we'll, we drink, we'll only, the better only put four was. of them. We'll only put four of them. There. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. We'll start with four. <laughs> Basically, what happened? Uh huh. And, and there was also, I remember a giveaway at some point where you were looking at like allowing somebody from, I think it was like a liquor barn giveaway to have yeah, somebody we just join, on the, join yeah, on the... He was uh, going to join us on the Nova Scotia expedition, but couldn't make it. And we'll be doing another one as well. So... Uh, I'll wait for the phone call. Wait yeah. for it. It's, it's coming. <laughs> and uh, the experience on the ship is incredible. It looks like it's really fun. That, that was one thing if Fred couldn't be here today. And uh, he said that you had the opportunity to, you know, he's... He said, "We're gonna we'll take Fred and we'll we'll go feed him to the sharks. Yeah, we'll just chum with Fred. Yeah, I <laughs> love asking about the sharks. <laughs> he was saying, he was saying, yeah, we'll we'll go swim with sharks, but Fred, you're not going in the cage, buddy. <laughs> you actually have to go swim. You. <laughs> Again, uh, guys, I want to say thank you again for coming on the you show. It. it was Thanks fantastic. A lot for coming out. Thanks yeah, for the booze. Being it was there. fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, make sure you follow everything that Trey is doing with Jefferson's on social media. And make sure you follow us as well, Bourbon Pursuit, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you like the show, make sure you all support us, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. Yep. And we love show suggestions, feedback, comments from all our listeners. And reviews. Uh, and reviews are important because... We got the most reviews of any bourbon podcast, but we like to steal even more. Coming. Even more. We like to have our egos petted. So. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, anyways, I pre really appreciate you all taking the time to, to hang out with us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Sounds great. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.